in person. I wish I was. Wow. Hopefully you guys had some great time to connect with each other this morning. Um, but I'm really excited that even though I'm not there, I can still share with you Panglossian. And what I really want to do is, yes, we'll talk about Panglossian in the business, but I really want to share with you uh, the approach and everything that brought me here today. So with that, I'm going to pull up some slides so you don't have to stare at me on the screen all morning. So just give me one second to do that. Let's see, maybe it won't let me. It looks like All right. So when I was little, the best holiday meals were really the ones that included my mom's famous cinnamon roll recipe. And we owned this really massive white bowl for the sole purpose of, I'm pretty sure, making way too many cinnamon rolls at a time. And most holidays, you'd come downstairs and sitting on the counter would be this white bowl with dough like rising over the top, almost spilling over the edges. And when I saw that, I knew that it was only going to be a matter of time until I'd be enlisted to help roll out the dough and finish making them. Well, a few years ago, I was finally trusted with this recipe. Um, and it was going to be because I was hosting my first family holiday dinner ever. And it was for my in-laws. So the stakes were high. And I kept telling myself, I need these cinnamon rolls to make this a success. Um, and so I got the recipe from my mom and the night before I'm standing in my kitchen, um, ready to roll out the dough and finish making them. And even though I had the recipe and even though, um, I had helped make them numerous times over the years, I was still ended up on the phone with my mom consulting me through the whole process. As I was standing there, I kept telling myself that if I just did everything exactly the way she did it, I would have not only this coveted cinnamon roll recipe, but people would think of me and my cinnamon rolls the same way they think of hers, which is remarkable. But now it wasn't just in cinnamon rolls that I wanted that, right? I wanted to be remarkable. So this story actually reminds me of something that Seth Godin said, which is that it's impossible to create work that both matters and pleases everyone. In other words, you can be remarkable, right? You can earn people's trust and attention, or you can be good, but you can't be both. So uh, before starting Panglossian, I worked for several years designing branded um, experiences and spaces for large national and international brands. And it was during this time and working with these brands that I began to notice this trend with nearly every single one of them. It's that they wanted to be remarkable, but their mindset and the approach that they would use and the approach that we would enforce, re like reinforce with them was keeping them from doing that. So when it comes to branding, most businesses focus on the parts of their brand that are most visible, that people interact with, right? They build a brand based on what they think will outperform their competitors or what they think a particular audience might want to see from them, regardless of if that brand they're building actually represents their work and what they do and how they work. So um, in the end, what usually happens is their branding doesn't do what they want it to do. And they continue to struggle to get people excited about their brand and loyal to their brand. And they ramble on about, you know, um, over explaining what they do, trying to communicate their uniqueness. Or on the flip side of that, they kind of give you these cookie cutter answers that doesn't help you differentiate how they're different from the next person down the street. So I started Panglossian um, to help small businesses really uncover what makes them remarkable so that they can have the confidence and the clarity to stand out and further their mission to better their corner of the world. Panglossian's approach is really 
designed to interrupt that sea of good brands, right? That if you, all it takes is a like scroll through social media to really see how similar brands look and sound to each other. So being a remarkable brand isn't about a beautiful logo or a perfectly curated feed. It isn't about being liked or even outbeating your competition. It's about an unwavering commitment to being who you said you'd be in your own unique way. So Panglossian's approach really is about kicking the good brand approach to the curb. Instead of starting with the parts of um, the brand that you see, the parts that are visible, like your logo, um, marketing collateral, your website, things like that, Panglossian's method really starts with what I call your brand foundation, your brand DNA, your mission and your purpose, your stories, how those things are all connected to one another to create a very genuine brand, right? It's about understanding your positioning and your persona, how those two things play together to make you stand out from your competition. And then once we have clarity around that, we can begin to extend it into your logo and your identity and the other parts of your brand. A study by Stackla found that 90% of consumers said that authenticity is important when deciding which brands to, that they like and trust. So, which is why remarkable brands are inevitably so loved. Um, they are crystal clear on their foundation, on who they are, and then they know how to extend that foundation out into the more visible parts of their brand. So recently I had a client who fell into the trap of, you know, they had been in business for years and over those years, they had built a brand of who they thought they needed to be in order to compete with their, in order to compete with their competition. And where they were at in their business was a point where they were about ready to give up. They didn't have the enthusiasm for their business that they once had. Um, they didn't get excited about talking about what made them different. And so they had worked with people before to get them to where they were on their branding, um, but they were still wanting to give it kind of like one last try to figure this out and to um, get a brand that they were excited about. So I took them through my process and I shipped their messaging off to them um, and quickly got a response back requesting to talk the next day. So we got in a call and it was honestly like talking to different people. They told me I had gotten them actually excited about what they were doing. They were having, they could see how this was a fun, like personality and persona and how it actually made them seem way different from their competitors. They finally felt again, empowered to communicate the value of their unique approach to their target clients. So when they went out to sell to people, they now had like the confidence in their messaging. They had a confidence in how they presented it um, in order to get those sales. And you know what? I didn't make their brand into anything that they weren't already at their core. All I did was I simply helped them peel away some false identities that they had built up and find a brand that they felt good in, find the messaging that they felt good in. So I offer two different sort of, and where I want to go and take it in the next year or so is creating um, these ways. So mini courses, workshops, um, things like that, where people can, who are those DIY businesses or those businesses who are early on can still have a way to understand their branding without making the full investment, right? It's getting them off on that right foot without making that big kind of um, investment early on in your business where, when funds can be tight. So to wrap it up here, I just have to say that I know that there's a lot of good brands and um, good people who are wildly successful out there. And if success is your goal, um, then you can keep following that path. But if you are a business who, you know, wants to wake up knowing that the work you do matters and wants to share your message with the world, then you need to know what makes you unlike anyone else, right? Because if you're designing your brand or your work or even your life to fit someone else's vision of good or someone else's expectations for you, then what makes you remarkable is going to continue to become smaller and smaller until even you can barely notice it. So 
in a blind taste test, <clears throat> the cinnamon rolls that I made that Thanksgiving, and honestly, every time since then, could have passed as my mom's. So, and yet they didn't change anyone's life. Like hers have changed mine and others. I copied someone else's recipe. I did exactly what someone told me to do. And the highest achievement I reached was good. My mom is a cinnamon roll queen, not because no one else can make good cinnamon rolls, but because when she makes them, she invites even the most amateur baker to become a part of making something great. That's what makes those remarkable. So I'm going to leave you with um, this one last little thought, and that's that there's no one you can possibly be that's as remarkable as being who you're designed to be. optimism, right? So that's one of the core foundation or core values that I had in my business. And I kind of wanted to put it out there um, as a statement to me and the world of what we're all about. So that's, that's where Panglossian comes from. How long does the process take with a typical client? So it's what I'm working, working on with um, and, and kind of how long some of those discovery pieces take. Uh, especially with the brand foundation. A lot of the work that we're doing in the brand foundation um, is oftentimes things that business owners haven't really thought about, or it's really making them dig deep into like their memory bank. Um, because what we're going to do is we're going to take all these stories and experiences that you have and connect them. So that piece um, and kind of gathering all that information can take a fair bit of time for entrepreneurs depending on how much time they have. Um, and then from there, the part where I take all of that information and piece it together into something that is like a concise message um, into your statements and all these other pieces, that part takes me probably like two to three weeks. So. So for your, uh, your targeted um, audience, uh, small business owners, are those local people or can it be uh, like startups? Can it be startups? Was that the end of your question? So, yeah, so my target audience, um, if I heard the question correctly, is it is primarily, it can be startups, it can be uh, small businesses. Um, the thing that works really well with my process are businesses that have sort of a greater mission and a greater message. Um, my process, it doesn't have as much meaning. I can definitely help them, but it doesn't have as much meaning for their business if you're purely a business who wants to make a profit, right? If that is your main goal, obviously that's important. I work with successful businesses um, and everything like that's, that's not the only piece, but if that's the only piece of your business or the primary piece of your business, then um, my brand, my branding process is just more than what you need. So my target audience is really those mission-driven type companies. I have a question. I also tend to work with um, smaller businesses. The reason for that is because um, when I was working with those large national and international brands who have these teams of people, um, you know, kind of managing their brand and their marketing. Uh, what I found is because their branding wasn't really infused into their DNA, um, there was still a really big disconnect between what they wanted to accomplish and achieve with their brand um, and what they were actually kind of implementing. And so working with small business owners kind of gets you to work with those people who are making the key decisions in the business and kind of have that, um, that vision and that passion from the start. I have a question for you. Uh, have you ever thought about workshops on personal branding? So a lot of people, you could do this for men or women, but women in particular, oftentimes, especially after having children, lose their identity 
and our identity is our brand. And uh, I mean, it's we all we all have a brand that we are like put into the world. Have you ever thought about doing empowerment workshops on people finding like their voice and what their brand is, and through that connecting with unsuspecting com companies and customers? You know, I have not ever really. Um ventured into personal branding and we're doing that. Um, but I really like what you said there, particularly about, um, you know, new moms and everything. I experienced exactly what you're describing uh, after I became a mom for the first time. So I totally identify with that and that need. And uh, to answer your question, um, no, I have never thought of that, but that is a really interesting piece. And there is a lot of crossover between uh, my approach to branding as, you know, and personal branding, right? Because all of, both of those things are all about, um, you know, being genuine in how you present yourself. And great presentation, by the way. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I have another question. Mm -hmm. how, how are you finding your targeted audience? How am I finding how, how are you approaching them? Yeah. So mainly I find them honestly through, um, I find, I find them mainly through like speaking engagements, through, um, referrals from past clients and things like that, just because I feel like people need to first hear kind of my approach and, and the reasoning behind it in order for them to kind of see that it's out there. Cause it's a bit different than the approach that a lot of, um, companies offer to small businesses, right? <clears throat> so I typically use, I leverage in-person networking a lot, referrals and uh, speaking engagements. Thank you for uh, presenting to us. My question for you is, how has COVID changed your business model and how do you see that carrying on into the future? You know, we're starting to see a resurgence and things like that. What, what does that mean to you and your strategy? Yeah, that's interesting. So for my like business strategy in particular, um, to be frank, like COVID hit when I was on uh, maternity leave. So um, it didn't affect too much how I was marketing because I was already taking that time off. Um, so I didn't really have to pivot like a lot of businesses who um, had to at that time since I was already on a break. But going forward, I think that it's really interesting. And I think that... Um, the kind of my approach to branding just becomes that much more relevant because we're seeing across a lot of different companies how they have to be more empathetic to people's like personal lives and situations and everything like that. Um, and so building your company um, around sort of your question and values and hiring those people who align with them, I think it's going to become increasingly important. Um, it already is, you know, important, but I think COVID's kind of accelerating a lot of that. Uh, oh, excuse me. No, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, uh, curiosity about, you were talking uh, about, uh, you know, you already have some large customers, no? Some large international companies. So they already have a message, they already have, they already have a brand and everything. So how difficult it, it, it is for them, you know, to transition to a new, uh, you know, to a new message, to the new brand that you are proposing based on, uh, you know, on uh, what you, you know, your discovery process is when uh, interviews or whatever. And also, uh, uh, a second question is, I mean, you were saying that um, uh, the brand helps you uh, express what you are, but isn't it also uh, the brand, uh, I mean, I see it also that it helps you become what you want to be or not. It does, it does do both, right? So um, to answer the first part of your question about my experience working with large brands and everything um, in, in their transitioning, how do they transition to something else? What's interesting with a lot of those brands is they have done a lot the work like a lot of them already have the values the core messaging they have an idea of who their customer is how to talk to them all of that and the piece that they're missing is that they don't live it out right that's where their disconnect is is that they have this massive brand bible 
and book, um, but they will easily um, or quickly uh, kind of abandon that to chase trends or to do what they think is going to get them sort of um, acceptance or likes from a large number of people. So that's kind of, or even like not even always acceptance from a large number of people like your audience. Sometimes it's, they will abandon those values and things because they need to hit a certain number in revenue that year. Right. So there are, they'll play like the short game versus the long game. It's the companies that are um, really committed to their vision and their values and are willing to kind of sometimes have to take um, not always a loss even, but have less in the short term because they're willing to play this long-term game. And that's a very different mindset than what's typical in business today. Um, and then um, the second part of your question, which was, I'm losing it now. Um, can you repeat the second part of your question? Saying that uh, it helps you uh, express what you are and uh, okay. from my perspective, I see that it, sometimes it uh, helps you become what you want, what you want to be, because you don't understand. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And to respond, it definitely does do well um, because your purpose really speaks to you know where you've come, how you've gotten to where you are, and then your vision kind of speaks to what you're working to achieve. Um, whether that's working to achieve through the products you sell, through how you work, all of that, right? There is kind of both a past and future piece to your brand. Um, but the reason I really kind of focus on that piece of who you are um, is again, because that's going to really what make, that's really what makes you feel genuine to your audience. Right. And um, if you if you show up as like trying to always be um, this perfect brand persona, right, or um, the future vision of what you want your brand to be and you're not there yet, then there are going to be times where you fall short of that in terms of your customer's expectations. So it really is a balance between um, representing who you are and representing where you want to go. Do you ever run into any intellectual property issues when you're coming up with a brand? Is that something that you need to be careful about or not? Uh, I'm not ran into that. Um, and part of that might be because I don't really get into trademarking or, um, you know, copywriting or anything like that. So, but I don't really have, I don't, I don't, ha I don't run into too much with intellectual property stuff yet. Just an example of a, a past client, maybe it was the company you worked with beforehand or maybe a current client who wouldn't mind you talking about you know, where they were with branding and then what you're able to do with them and a you know, really positive outcome. Sure. Um, so a client that I worked with um, in this past month is it's their small business and they are really... Um, They've been in business for about five years and they are someone who they had a, a greater mission that they wanted to kind of communicate, but they kind of kept always running into this, this issue where they didn't have the words to say what they wanted to say. Um, and so it was taking, what I do is I really take them through this process uh, for their brand foundation that kind of, again, pulls out their stories and everything like that. And they're like, kind of, um, you know, putting this all out there. And it's kind of funny always, because when I have them do this exercise, they're like, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do with all this. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I'm giving you enough information. And then, you know, I take that, we have conversations about it and everything. And then we create kind of these statements that really come from them. They're just um, sort of polished and refined and connecting all their stories and everything. And then from there, they're like, the, the reaction that I usually get from this client in particular was like, I don't know how you got what you did out of what I gave you. Um, and yet it still sounds exactly like us. It's just said in a way that I could never articulate before. Um, and 
so that one is like, that one's pretty new. So I don't have like specific results on like how that one's going to be rolled out to their clients. Right. But for them, like just having that, like clarity is going to help them kind of sell better. Right. Cause what they're doing is very different. They're a jeweler. They make custom jewelry. Um, and it's a very different approach than people who just like go to a jewelry store and buy, um, something pre-made and there's reasoning behind that. Um, and there's, um, value behind doing it and buying from them versus buying from a jewelry store. So being able to communicate what that value is in a very concise way was something that was really valuable and important to them. Um, the client that I gave in, uh, the, the example that I gave in the presentation, um, was a client who they had been in business, I want to say for 10 or 15 years. Um, and they were, they're like a small two to five person firm. Um, and they had this new approach that, like I said, they always kind of downplayed what the value of it was. Like they were still trying to communicate how it was valuable using, um, like industry jargon and things like that, because they thought that that's what they needed to do in order to help their target audience understand the value and importance of their approach. Um, but in doing that, they kind of made them sound pretty much like the other options that are already out there. And so that was really hard for them to kind of get the clients that they wanted. And so um, they, since working with me, have had, you know, clients again, they are excited about sharing, um, what they do with the clients and everything like that. And, um, their business is doing a lot better now. So. And too, a lot of times when I work with people, um, they're kind of at that point in their business. So I do work with a few people who are starting out, but mainly they've been in business for at least three years or so. Um, and they're kind of at that point where they want to grow their business, right? So they're at the point where they're considering bringing on team members and understanding their brand. And after, you know, we go through their brand foundation, they really realize how they can use their brand foundation in their hiring process as well. They can use it to find um, people who are going to identify with their values and with their mission and who are going to be excited about coming to work because of, you know, what they're trying to achieve rather than just coming to work to get a paycheck. So. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, this is Eric. Hi, uh, nice presentation. I really like what you're doing approach. Uh, one, two questions, I think I said one. One is, uh, and you mentioned in one of your examples, your stories uh, about working with companies that have already perhaps gone through a branding exercise. So how do you transition? Um, and, and I'm thinking about a couple of my own examples here. So I'm curious how you handle this. You know, working with a company that's already they've gone through a branding um, and, you know, I presume because they're talking with you, maybe it's not working. It's not a, a, a good a fit as they were hoping, or maybe it's out of date. Um, how do you pick up and kind of transition uh, or, or what do you do in a case like that? Yeah. So before I work with anybody, I always um, have a call with you and kind of find out where you're at, um, what your expectation, like if you have a, have branding already and you've gone through a branding exercise, we talk about that experience. Uh, we talk about what you expected out of that and where it's falling short because at the end of the day, like, I don't, if I don't think that I can help you, um, like, I want to make sure you work with someone who does. And so it's through kind of that call that I understand a lot more about um, where things went wrong. And if it's, if it's in the process, if it's in, then I might be able to help you if it's in um, that there's pieces that are missing or you didn't really truly get to the heart of what your brand is all about, then I can help you. If it's, um, you know, if it's more based on, you know, things that you just don't like it, um, then we have to talk about that a little bit more because 
What I don't want you to do is just continue to build a brand that's based on trends or based on your preferences, right? Like my approach to branding really gets past that um, and is really influenced by your personality. Um, it's by, influenced by kind of the stories. It's influenced by what you want to achieve with your branding and all of that or with your brand and all of that. And so um, to, to kind of answer your question in a short way is, I learn a lot about you on that call and then kind of see if that is something that I can help you with. The other thing that I can do with businesses, um, you know, it might just be like a little piece of their brand or branding is off and they may not need to go through a full brand refresh or a full, um, you know, brand foundation uh, approach, right? And they may just need to make a few tweaks to their messaging or a few tweaks to something, right? And so that's where those hour long strategy sessions that I do with people kind of come into play. Like, because I can evaluate your, your brand or I can evaluate your website um, or even like your, what you do statements uh, to kind of figure out how we can make those, um, how we can make little tweaks to those things to, to make them resonate more. Do you find your approach uh, is generally applicable to any industry or type of business, or do you focus? Or... Um, I would say that it is applicable to any industry. It's more where it doesn't work are, again, like the businesses who have um, a primarily profit-only mindset or... Um, you know, businesses who just don't have like a real clear um, mission or vision that they want to achieve, even if they can't articulate it. Like if you have that, then, then, you, then I can work with you. Um, it's just like, if you're, if you're really profit focused, um, then it's not, it's not going to be for you. Great. Thank you. Really enjoy this. Oh, I've got a question before we get to our final question. Uh, where do you see this going in about three to five years? What's your what's your big plan? The big plan. Um, so that it's actually going to be going through quite a few changes uh, in the next quarter. So um, I am trying to like I will always keep doing like the one on one type services and everything that I offer. But I would like to branch out more into offering um services and things that can, that I can <laughs> um, and that's, that's kind of circumstances where businesses just need a little bit of guidance. They can um, do the work themselves. They just need someone to kind of give them the process and give them back along the way. Um, so I see building out um, these mini courses in the next six months. Um, and they aren't going to be like the courses where it's just a pre-recorded video and you're off on your own to, to kind of figure it out based on the information you're given. It's still going to be interactive with me. Um, it's just going to be more in a group type setting. Uh, and then, so that's kind of in the near future, um, down the road where I'd like to go and what I've, what I would like to have happen with, uh, my business is. There's a couple pieces that I want to add on to my process. And one of those is really um, like a mindset type coaching piece, because um, as I've kind of hit on during this talk today is habits play so much habits and mindset play so much into um, how you execute your brand, right? Like a lot of businesses and brands can go through the process of uncovering what they're all about, but if they don't have the habits and the mindset in place, they can easily abandon um, kind of what they discovered and what they came up with. And so having a mindset um, and habit piece that I can support those uh, is something that I I'm really interested in, in building out and bringing into my services as well. Very nice. Any other questions? If not, I will ask our traditional final question we have here at One Million Cups, Iowa City. What can we as a community do to help you? Well, a couple things. One, I would like to hear, um, 
I'm always looking for people's thoughts on this idea and this approach. Um, if they feel like it's relevant for their type of business, what they think would be valuable as well. So that's kind of the first piece is just sort of feedback and thoughts on that. Um, and then the other piece is just like my, you know, I, I say my vision is to see a world filled with remarkable brands. And so I always ask that people, when they come to that point of branding, um, to really find someone who is a good fit for you because you have a remarkable brand um, within your business. And so you owe it to yourself to find it. Yeah. So, um, well, for the next two weeks, you can find me at Panglossian Creative uh, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, you can also reach out to me uh, via email, but I am going to be renaming um, in the next two weeks. So those things will all change, but there will be announcements on social media for that as well, for what that's going to be. I do have a LinkedIn. Yep. So you can find me Kirsten Heitman on LinkedIn as well.